Hello again, everybody. Um, so it's Jeff, and I'm picking up from where we left off last time. So um, when we left off, I was very rushed trying to keep things under an hour and failing. And um, we had just finished putting together uh, our window class and uh, sort of going over what our SDL application is going to sort of run through. Um, as it executes. So I, I want to sort of run through that one more time just so that we can kind of reinforce the way that an SDL application uh, works and sort of compare that to the way that um, game, game loops usually work and um, then we're going to dive into rendering textures to the screen. Um, and hopefully we'll even get to uh, think about these textures as being within physics coordinates so that we can then start to work our way toward being able to connect um, systems of a physics world and bodies and things like that that are all moving around in meters and meters per second uh, to where they should render on the screen. Now that's sort of our long-term goal. We're not going to get all the way there in this video. I just want to sort of focus on um, rendering objects and being able to sort of render um, at a physical coordinate and have that transferred into render coordinates in on screen. But the basic process that this application flows through is that starting up consists of making sure that SDL is running, creating our window, making sure that there's any SDL plugins that we're using that are running. So in this case we want to initialize um, SDL image. Now this wasn't an important step for last video because if I hit run you will recall that I get a black screen. It's very exciting. Um, so this doesn't look like much. It doesn't seem like this should be what we get for writing like 300 lines of code. It seems kind of kind of a cheat, doesn't it? Um, well, let me tell you, there's a lot that goes inside that window. The fact that we even get to a window, it's pretty significant stuff. Finally, we're going to start using a little bit of this. So this process for initializing SDL image is going to be essential to loading textures. So um, a big thing that I want to sort of dive into this week is firstly, how do we load textures from the disk? Um, and now that I think of it, I think I'm going to have to grab a couple of textures um, from this version of the application. So I had thrown in a couple. I have this like star.ping, so that's that's what we're gonna that's what we're gonna load in. So I'm just gonna copy this star.ping and I'm gonna put it inside my A3 demo here. So that's what I have. Um, if you're following along this, this tutorial, you can really copy in any PNG file that you want. Doesn't matter. Like, don't make it porn, but something. Um, okay, so having that image in there, um, that uh, actually, um, if you don't have the image that you're looking for in there, there will be an interesting error. So I'm going to make sure to bring that up later. If that I misspell the name of my image, what happens? How does it break? So that's going to be a, a good topic to sort of cover. So we start the application, get everything running. We load assets. Now, last time, of course, we had no assets to load. This time around, we're going to be filling some things in here. Then update until update returns true. Now, I had a to-do in there. Updating and rendering goes in here. Um, so we're obviously going to be adding some things in here in order to be able to update the screen with, um, with uh, whatever needs to be drawn. Of course, unload assets is going to be um, making sure that any texture data that we load uh, gets released from memory. And we have stop finally, which uh, mostly goes about sort of releasing top level things like the window and um, quitting out of SDL image and the SDL core. 
So this isn't really going to change. Um, start isn't really going to change. Uh, mostly the work that we're doing to start with here is going to fall in the middle of this load assets, update, unload assets. This is, this is the bulk of, of what we're going to do today. So um, before we can really do anything in there, though, we need to back up a little bit. So we need to load textures using SDL. Well, OK, so what does that mean? Similar to a window, um, when we create an SDL window, we wanted to make a wrapper class that would allow us to sort of access and interact with that window in a way that we were sort of more comfortable with. or really when I say that I guess what I mean is a more object-oriented window. Again, not saying that object-oriented programming is the be-all and end-all of the universe, but it's what we know and um, it's generally a pretty good bet. So we made a window class so that we could think of window objects as being sort of isolated and self-contained so that they could sort of have a list of the operations that we reasonably expect to use on a window and that it would be able to go about interacting with SDL on its own um, in a way that makes sense for those things. So we're going to do something very similar to this for textures. Um, so I am going to add another class and so I'm going to call this one texture and um, inside texture, um, it should be kind of no surprise to anyone at this point what I'm going to copy in here. Um, string and sdl.h uh, are pretty much my bread and butter here because I use strings for everything error related, so I'm definitely going to have one of those. And I need sdl.h in order to be able to use any of the classes such as sdl renderer or sdl texture. Um, that I'm going to be using in here. Um, so this time, now that we're familiar with what um, kinds of data types you might run into, I'm just going to begin with those. So again, I'm using this uint32. Um, you could just call this int and that would be fine. Um, but um, you'll notice that more experienced people with um, C++ will sort of opt for like what seem to beginners as weirder types like this. Really, this gives me better guarantees. Now, last time I didn't really take a whole lot of time to explain this, but what this tells me, uint32, so what does that all mean? Now, when I say that you could replace this with int, that's true. Integer will do most of the things that this thing is doing, except uint means unsigned. It means this thing can't be negative. Um, you would think, well, that's annoying. That just means that I can't make the number negative. Well, if the number is never going to be negative, and I'm pretty sure the height of the window or the height of the texture is never actually going to be negative, then that tells us something about the data. When I see a variable that's declared as uint32, that tells me something about whether it's negative or not and it, it gives me a better idea of what to expect as a programmer, for one. It's possible to do something uh, like this. You can write it like this, using a primitive. Unsigned int will signal to the compiler that you do, in fact, want an unsigned integer so that it can never be negative. It will go from 0 up to the maximum that 32 bits can represent, and if it goes any higher than that, it just wraps right back around to 0. Now, you'd say, well, I could just do this instead. And I'd be like, yeah, that's true. Um, but depending on the system that you run this on, it might actually be 16 bits, or it might be 32 bits, or it might be 64 bits. Most of the time when we're writing PC games, we don't really have to worry about these things. But on consoles, things can get weird. Because, for example, the PS3 has one processor that runs at 32 bits normally, another one that runs at 64 bits normally, and another one that runs at 128 bits. And when you're trying to shuttle data around between those different processors that work with, like, different bit lengths, it can be awfully nice to have a guarantee of exactly what size your data is. Um, so I'm not saying that this is the thing that you have to do, but um, it helps. 
Um, and another thing, totally sort of unrelated, but um, unsigned variables uh, are handled by the compiler differently and can be optimized sometimes more effectively than signed variables. Um, so I advise using uh, using unsigned variables whenever it's appropriate to do so, um, just, just to be in a good habit for performance reasons. Um, sort of moving on from there, we've got our SDL renderer and SDL texture objects. So these are pointers to the SDL, um, the like internal SDL types that will be representing these things. So this SDL texture is SDL's own interpretation of the texture and its data and how it gets drawn and all of those things. And the renderer is going to be the renderer that this texture should draw to. Now in this case, if you remember from our window class, our window also has a renderer. So in this case, the window holds on to a renderer that is going to be used to update the window. So that should mean that at least in an application where we're displaying one window, that this render is going to be the render of the window that we want to draw these textures on. So that's basically how that's gonna work. Um, now I'm going to uh, throw in the remainder of the functions here and we're gonna talk a little bit about those. So you'll notice that I have two constructors defined here. So I have a parameter list constructor and I also have one where I can supply a path to a texture and um, tell it what I want the renderer to be to start with. Um, I'll discuss that when we get there. Um, so like a window, we have the init and free functions here. So um, init looks very similar to this. You'll notice that init and my fancy constructor have the same function signature. That should be a good indication to you that that means that when I call this texture constructor that I am automatically calling the init function. This texture constructor does not. We'll so, we'll, I'll show you that in a moment. Of course, init um, loads the image at this path from the disk and sets up an SDL texture object um, that represents uh, what this what this uh, texture is and does and free um, destroys the texture to make sure that that memory is released. So they're opposites of one another. Render is the big bad of this whole bunch. You'll notice that it has a lot of function arguments. It takes in an x and a y. So this is saying what are the x y coordinates on screen that I want to draw the texture at. Clip can be used um, in, I'm, if I recall, um, do do do. What does clip stand for? Give me something to go on. So SDL clip is an SDL rect, and why is it giving me trouble? Let me build this and see if it complains. Okay, it's good. Um, clip allows me to specify a rectangle um, from the source texture where I could pull this out of. So it's possible to actually make an image um, that is a what we call a texture atlas or sometimes a sprite sheet. So a sprite sheet is a very is a particular kind of, of texture atlas, but a lot of the time you'll see this texture atlas thing. It's very frequently used in UI. Uh, and 2D assets where you're sort of, it's very efficient for the graphics card to load a large image and hold all that stuff in the same place and just render tiny chunks of that image rather than the whole thing. Um, and so uh, this is really good because it loads quickly from the hard drive. It uses very little video memory um, compared to having a whole bunch of ones separate. There's a lot of good things about this. We're not gonna use this feature, but this is what Clip does. So it's a good thing to keep in mind. Um, so angle has to do with rotating the image and we're not going to talk about that yet. Um, there's not really any reason to discuss rotating things in this course, so I'm going to stay away from this. But if you want to fool around with having things rotate, I'll be happy to talk about it sometime. 
Um, SDL point center. This relates to the angle. This tells it the point around which the image should pivot. So if you don't want the image to pivot around its top left corner, you might have to supply an SDL point to indicate to it how it should rotate the image to render it. And SDL renderer flip is a value to indicate whether you want the texture to be mirrored horizontally or vertically so that it is like automatically flipped. Therefore, you don't need two different images for uh, your platformer character facing left and your platformer character facing right because it can just use this flip to indicate which facing you intend to render. So this render function does a lot of stuff. Um, we're only really going to be using the X and Y parts of this for now, but realize there is so much more that could be done with this. Other than this, we have three more functions. Um, none of these are terribly important, but they are kind of helpful. I have this set alpha function. So what this does is it makes it so that I can set the, um, I can set this texture to draw partially transparent or entirely transparent if I want. So by setting this alpha value, that means that I can render this in front of something else and see through to whatever is behind it if I need to. Um, and that's pretty cool. Set color is very similar to this, but um, You'd think, well, what do you mean set the color? Like the image has color in it, like that's how it works. Um, and you're right, but this is pretty useful. What this does is it sets a color to mix the texture with. By default, it's mixing with white, but we can make it so, for example, this is mixing with red. You've probably seen this in old games. Um, this is a very old school common effect. Um, your like Super Nintendo and probably a fair amount of like N64 and like PlayStation era games when your character gets hit usually you have some kind of knockback effect and you'll flash red for a second you have that like you know flashing red where it's sort of showing you that you're currently experiencing invincibility frames um, but also that you just took damage um, that's very frequently done with some sort of set color effect that changes the color of the texture to be rendered. Um, so that's that. this is a way that you can do that sort of thing. And set blend mode is a little bit complicated to describe, but this, this determines um, the math that's used to, rent, to, mix, um, to mix color with whatever is um, behind, this, uh, behind this object in the scene. So... I'm not going to discuss this one in too much detail, but it's there. You'll talk about this more when you get to talking about OpenGL graphics. So I'm going to just sort of, as I did before, go through the CPP um, and sort of lay down uh, the, the things that we're sort of starting off with. I should double check that I write. Okay, so um, before I go too far, I want to make sure that we have these includes. So of course I'm using string stream in here um, and I'm using SDL image. Um, now I don't I know I did this in the last video, but um, there was probably somebody out there who was asking the question, why are you including these in this CPP file? Like sometimes you're including stuff in .h and sometimes you're including stuff in CPP. What gives? Um, to be honest, the answer to this is a little bit deep, um, but what I want to say is these, these includes are going to be used in this CPP file. In, in my function definitions, I'm going to have local variables, like function local variables that use string stream, and I'm going to have some functions that are using the functions available through SDL image. But nowhere do those types need to appear inside this class. Nowhere do I need to use them as the type of, of data that's being stored by a member or returned by a function or um, as a parameter to a function. Those things aren't necessary in here. So I put them into my CPP. Well, why not? It seems like it would be a lot more organized if everything was just in one place. The short answer to this is basically that you should prefer to include things in your CPP if at all possible because it makes it harder to get certain kinds of linker errors which are going to cause you to pull your hair out. Um, 
there are ways that you can encounter what is referred to as a circular dependency um, that can lead to the linker just basically like freaking out and telling you that like nothing's going to compile and it doesn't make any sense and I don't know what the hell is going on. Um, and it's hard to diagnose at first and it can often be a little bit of a pain in the ass to track down exactly what's going wrong. So uh, my advice is if at all possible write your include statements in your CPP file if they're only being used in the CPP file. If they are being used in the .h file then fine, bring the include statement up into the .h file so that it's available here. There are more tricks that you can use here than just these, but um, it's a good rule to follow. Um, you will eventually encounter these problems and you will understand why I do weird things like this. Um, yeah, it's a matter of experience. You'll run into it. So, um... To prevent myself from going too far on a tangent, let's just talk about this constructor. So um, this should be no big surprise. Um, of course, we're setting our pointers that we have, SDL texture and SDL renderer are both being set to null because they are pointers. So we want to indicate that if they aren't set, they should be set to null, which means zero also. Um, so we're making sure these pointers are null and that our width and height by default are zero. Uh, really, these could be set to anything, but I think zero is the most sensible number for if there's no texture data. There then should be no pixels, right? So no height, no width. Makes sense. The other constructor that I have set up here is one that automatically calls init. So we had talked about this a little bit. Um, so this one sets these defaults, but then goes on to take the path and a new renderer and call init to load the texture, um, the texture data from the hard drive um, and build the SDL texture object that this thing is going to, uh, that this thing is going to use. Next on the agenda is a destructor and this one just looks like Windows destructor. So um, if you remember from looking at our window class, um, so we had a destructor here that just calls free. Now, there's probably somebody out there also who's asking, well, why didn't we just write the stuff that window needs to do to free itself into the destructor? Why not just do that? Well, there, there are times where you can't actually destruct something. You notice in our main here where we have a window, but it's not a pointer. Um, there's no point where I can actually delete this object. This object is going to exist for the entire application. Um, so what that means is that's why I have window.init that gets called here because this window exists, but until the point that SDL is ready and everything is set up there, I can't really initialize it and get it going or load its resources. So I have init for that purpose. And then once everything has happened and things are stopping, I can't really delete this object, but what I can do is free all the Windows resources when I'm done. So I would generally recommend having an init and a free and using a constructor and your destructor to call those in the case of most of your SDL objects. Just in case you, you are not holding pointers to these, um, so that you have the ability to free resources when things are done. This is my advice. Uh, you don't have to, but uh, I think it's good practice, so uh, maybe give that a little bit of thought. What does free look like for a texture? That might as well be answered next. So if the SDL texture, so this being like the actual like texture object stored by um, SDL, if that isn't null, so if it's set to something, then I want to destroy that texture object. I want to set this variable back to null, and I want to clear my height and width right now. So that's what I'm going to go about doing. I'm just going to clear this out and free free all this stuff up. Um, 
you could reset the renderer, but uh, you don't technically have to um, because the renderer could stay the same. Even if you loaded fresh resources, you could then tell it load a file, but you don't necessarily have to supply a new renderer. Um, it probably doesn't hurt for me to... Oh, yeah, nice. So um, as with window, in it is a big is a pretty big chunk of stuff that's going on here. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take this in steps. Um, so there's there's more that's gonna go in here. We haven't got all of this stuff, but I wanna I wanna look at this to begin with is just sort of what what it does on the surface and how we sort of work through this step by step. So when I initialize a texture, um, you'll notice the first thing I'm doing is calling free. Why? Well, what if I initialize a texture that's already initialized, that I've already loaded texture data for it? Well, that might mean if I were to load this up and then get a fresh SDL texture created, well, wouldn't that mean that I've lost track of the other image data? And images are fairly big, or they can be. I've just lost a fairly big chunk of memory. I want to make sure that when I initialize a texture that I definitely, definitely am not holding on to another image because that is an easy way to lose a big chunk of memory and have a really nasty memory leak. So my first thing that I'm going to do is get rid of any existing texture data just in case. And then we are going to start using some of the things that are in SDL image. So image load um, lets us load the file at this path. Because we have used um, SDL image and um, brought in, you'll notice if you remember from, is it in our main? Uh, yeah. This image flags, this image init ping, this is telling um, SDL image to ready the, the code to be able to um, load .png files. And so now when I call image load path dot um, C string, uh, that will get us it saying load the ping file at this path and we'll do that. Uh, if load so this returns an SDL surface pointer um, and as with most things in SDL, if the surface pointer is set to null after image load runs, we have an error, so like the rest of the times that I've reported errors, I usually build it up as a string stream. I can call image get error to get the most recent error from SDL image, and I'll throw that as an exception. Uh, you may handle that differently, but that's the way that I choose to, uh, to handle that. So there's going to be a couple of things that come up here that um, aren't entirely necessary, but I want to introduce you to these concepts. This function, SDL set color key. Um, so a color key is basically a background color used in a sprite sheet where you mean for that color to me, like you mean for that color to represent transparent. Um, so you may use black, you might use just you know, you might use green, you might use a whole bunch of different things. It could be kind of any color. But um, generally what this means is that whatever this color is in the background, you intend for that to be interpreted as though it is um, so that it is acting as, as transparent. Um, now, this has to be done from a surface. So we load the surface first and we pass the surface to it that we want to color key. And um, there is, to be honest, I can't remember what this flag represents. Um, and then there's this function, SDL map RGB. This is a complicated thing to describe, but basically what's happening here is I am determining what image format the surface is in and then transforming a color 0, 0, FF, FF. So this is like, uh, I guess green and blue are max. So this is like cyan probably 
yeah, so basically I'm expecting if their background is cyan, then treat that as as um, transparent. Um, that's This is somewhat complicated. Don't worry too much about this. You don't really need this, but um, it's a... It's a pretty interesting concept, and let me see. I'm pretty sure there's a lesson on this, actually. Color keying, lesson 10. Um, so, for example, yeah, this is the case where we had a cyan background, so we got this little, like, stick man dude, and as you can see in the top here, it's being rendered into the scene with a transparent background. So that's basically what this is for. Don't worry about it too much. You don't really need it. Um, so... This is where I use this new renderer variable. Um, so, new renderer can be set to null if you want it to. Um, you'll notice in the uh, definition in the .h file that I have made it so that new renderer is by default set to null. So, what that means is if I only pass the path here, it will assume that the renderer that I intend to use is the one that this texture was using last time. Um, and so, if new render isn't set to null, or if new render isn't set to null, it must be set to something that we want to become the new renderer, so we'll set the renderer. This could lead to a very serious error, possibly, if you just simply don't give it a renderer in the first place. If you never assign a renderer, uh, there is going to be an issue, which will come up when you run this code. So at this point, this is where we are creating a texture. So this surface is basically a temporary object that exists until we can build the texture object itself. SDL create texture from surface is the thing that returns your SDL texture pointer. So SDL texture, you remember that one from over here. So this is your SDL texture pointer that we're holding on to. So that's the thing that creates this. It requires a renderer and the surface to be able to do that. If this renderer wasn't set, I guarantee you this will f it will it will barf. Um, and as usual, create the message. In this case, we're using SDL get error, um, and we're throwing the error as an exception. So, if anything went wrong and you didn't supply a renderer, uh, that should error out right here. And then lastly, I set up some image dimensions. Basically, at this point, um, we have created the SDL texture. Um, still, we're able to use this surface for some things. So the surface that loaded this can give us the height and the width of the image that we intend to store. And then lastly, now that we've gotten to this point, we just want to make sure that this surface gets freed um, from SDL because we're not going to hold on to it. So we need to make sure that this goes away right now, or again, memory leak time. Um, surfaces also probably hold a fair amount of data. If this thing had to load a, an entire image file from disk, uh, that could potentially be a fair amount of memory, depending what your texture sizes are like. Um, so, so definitely, definitely remember to do this. So um, again, sort of reinforcing, we free whatever image resources that we might be using for this texture before we try to initialize it and we make sure to clean up the surface that we use to initially load it um, at the end of the initialization and that prevents us from running into any problems uh, losing memory to the abyss. All right so that's it for the init function I promise that's that's all that's going in there but this part and this part, those are the chunks that really matter to you. So focus on those ones. Um, before I do render, I'm just going to drop in a couple of smaller functions. Um, render's not that big really either, but we had talked about these. We have our set alpha, set blend mode, set color. Um, really, these are just proxying to... Um, functions that are being run in SDL. So SDL set texture alpha mod. Um, so I'm just saying for my SDL texture, set the alpha to what I send in. So if you int 32 means an unsigned integer of 32 bit length, you int eight means give me an unsigned integer that is eight bits long. So one byte. 
Um, so I can have a value between 0 and 255 for alpha. Set blend mode, so set texture blend mode, it takes in this. Again, I don't really want to discuss this too much because it's actually kind of complicated. And um, set color, so you give it red, a byte for red, byte for green, byte for blue, and then you call set texture color mod and it will change that for you. So those are the sort of minor functions. And then lastly, I'm going to drop in render. So there are a couple pieces of render to pay attention to here. So if you recall, there were a lot of arguments that get passed in here. So you've got X and Y position, this SDL rect that represents a like a tiny chunk of the source texture that you might mean to render out. You've got the angle to rotate it, the point around which to rotate it, and whether or not to flip it horizontally or vertically. There's a ton of stuff. Now, as I said, we're going to only focus on a fairly small chunk of this. So, um, the function that we need to use at the end of the day, the one that we need to build up all of our arguments to pass into it, is SDL render copy X. Um, in order to render the texture to a renderer, it needs the renderer that we intend to draw the texture to, the SDL texture itself, this clip to indicate what, like, what to draw, the, um, this is, this render quad specifies a different SDL rect that is used to determine what area of the screen to draw to. So this is saying X, Y are our top left corner of the image and width and height will be how far the image goes like to the right and down uh, from that point. And then we've got angle, center, flip. Again, we're not really using any of these things. Basically, render quad we're creating on the spot here because what we're doing is fairly simple. We're not trying to resize this image or anything like that at this point. All we're doing is say, draw this image to the screen at XY at its native size. Just use its width and its height and just draw it in place. That's all we need. Now, this clipping business I'm not going to dig into that. Um, you could probably go with without this statement, but um, because you're never really going to be setting clip anyway, therefore clip is probably likely to be null all the time for what you're trying to do. Um, so don't worry about this one too much. Um, but so basically the big thing is this render quad and using SDL render copy X. So that's, that's the, that, that the, yeah, that's the big stuff. Um, so now I realize I've taken a good long chunk of time to sort of go through what this texture does, but there's really not very much that we have to change about our main in order to actually tie into this and really start using it. So like our window, um, we're going to add a texture to our main here. Now, oh, it complains. Well, that's all right. It's really just because we didn't include our texture class yet. So now that that's been included, that looks good. So now, like I said, the big changes come between load assets and unload assets. Um, and we're going to do something simple to start off with. Um, loading a texture is really not a big deal. Um, Oh, uh, this is uh, this is my mistake. Um, my versions of texture and window um, have made a minor improvement to these classes where instead of making everything public, I am using getters and setters like I should be. Um, we're going to address that problem sort of in a future version of this um, where we clean things up a little bit and try and tidy up our code some. But for now, I'm just going to leave everything public so that it's just nice and straightforward to, to do some of this stuff. So you might notice me changing the endings of some things that I paste in here in order to, to match that up, but that's all I'm doing. 
Um, so, okay, so let's, before anything, focus on load assets and unload assets. So um, load assets is where we're going to be calling texture.init for a lot of our things. Because once the application is started up and our image loading, like SDL is up and running and our window is up and running and we've got our image library like ready to go, at this point we're in a good position to load our assets up by calling texture.init. We give it a file name and we pass it the renderer that we want to use here. So in this case, it's just window.render because all of our textures, we just want to draw them to this new window. Now, so you'll notice that this star.png, you'd be like, well, okay, but you didn't give it a path. Like you just gave it the file name. Like, where's it going to look? Well, if you give it the file name bear, it will look inside your project folder by default. So this is why I put star.ping inside with the VCX proj file here for A3 demo. Um, so that's what's happening inside here. Um, and again, uh, for unload assets, um, we're just gonna call texture.free, that easy. Just make sure that that texture memory gets, uh, gets dealt with and um, returned to uh, the operating system. And you're gonna say, oh my God, what do we have to do for all this updating and rendering? Well, because the texture class is so clean and kind of handles everything for us pretty nicely, there's not very much that we have to do at all. We have three lines of code that do the bulk of the work. Window.clear, so before we start rendering, clear the window. So just make sure to draw it filled with a color. Then we'll start writing on that blank canvas by rendering our texture. And then we have to call window.draw because this is necessary to tell the renderer to actually put its frame buffer onto the window. And just for one tiny little additional flourish, um, our window does in fact have the ability to tell if it's minimized. So, um, oh, pardon me. Again, this is another one of these cases where I'm using, uh, yeah, that should take care of it. So, um, because our window can tell when it's minimized, um, we can even prevent the application from drawing when the window isn't visible. Why waste CPU on this game rendering itself when nobody's looking at it? Seems like a, a good way to deal with that. So, this should piece together a pretty complete um, texture um, that should draw at 200, 300. So we have a window that's gonna show up at 1600 by 900, and this should draw at 200, 300. Now remember the coordinate system is from the top left corner, and positive Y is downward. So that means we're 200 across to get to this point, and 300 down to get to this point. So this is a little bit counterintuitive for most of us who are interested in thinking about this uh, from a physics perspective. We would like Y to be up. It's generally a more sensible way to come at problems, especially if we're trying to make something, say, like a platformer, where you're running along usually near the bottom of the screen and when you jump you probably want to think of that as moving into the positive y direction and coming back down. Um, that is normally the way that we think about the world. So this presents to us sort of a weird problem. How do we make the render world um, work when y faces in an opposite direction to how we normally do things? That's, um, that's a problem that we approach using that, remember this thing I've been mentioning all along, this MVP matrix that I keep talking about, and um, this amazing visual aid image that I so like to pop up in front of us, which whenever it loads, that'd be cool. So. I've talked about this a little bit already, right? So where in the physics world we've got this positive Y 
and 2, 3 here means that we go across 2 on the x-axis and we go up 3 on the y-axis, right? But here, that 2, 3 puts us in a, in a position sort of at the bottom of the screen if we translate this into where the screen is here. But in order to get this nice transition so that this point shows up in the same place both in the physics world and the render world, we need to use an MVP matrix to accomplish this. So this is a model view projection matrix. And I'm going to leave it to Scott, being the graphics wizard that he is, to explain to you in greater detail what we need to do in order to um, really get to the bottom of how MVPs work. But I'm gonna show you the operations that you need to use in order to get something visible um, for the window and the renderer that we have here so that textures can draw to somewhere uh, a little bit more useful than where they are right now. Um, in order to accomplish that, I'm going to go grab my Vector3 class, um, which I have in here as well. I need, uh, yeah, I need matrix4.h, I need vector3.cpp and vector3.h. So I am just going to copy those files over. I am going to paste them into my A3 demo project. Um, I'm assuming at this point that you have access to matrix4.h and that you've created your own vector3.h and .cpp uh, for this purpose. Um, so you can use your own vector3.h here. So I'm just going to drop these into this project just so that they're available. And um, so I'm going to work on building this MVP matrix. Now I know that we've talked about this briefly in some other videos. So we're going to be doing more or less the same thing here that we have been um, elsewhere. So when we've done that um, in, uh, in the video where we were testing um, our matrix 4 and vector 3. Now in that case it only gave us coordinates, like it showed us that it was transforming but we couldn't really see the results. So it was a little bit hard to visualize what was going on there, but finally we're going to be able to do that. So I'm going to change a few things around here. I'm going to start off at this location. So you'll notice of course I started off by including matrix 4.h because I know I'm going to be using matrix 4 right now. And here, I guess I don't need this to-do statement, and I'm not going to need this to-do statement, so I'm going to throw that in here. And I'm going to copy in a few lines uh, similar to those that you have seen so far. Oh, yeah, I have to uh, add a couple of things in. So this MVP matrix is, this variable that it's complaining about, is going to become a variable um, in the main here. So that's now resolved. And this, these variables here, um, we are going to add as additional parameters to start. So um, I'm simply going to grab those. So after pixel height here, I'm going to insert x min, x max, y min, y max. Uh, I will need to do the same thing to the definition here, otherwise it will complain. So both of those things are in place, so now it has access to these variables. So these are now avail available locally to this function, so xmin, xmax, ymin, ymax are being supplied here. What we are going to need to change is how start gets called in order to accommodate this. Um, I guess I'll just get that out of the way now. Um, so what I had done is I added some more defines to say what the min x min x or min x max x min y max y are in here so you'll notice that i have minimum x at negative 8 max x at positive 8. so that makes a width of 16 from the minimum to the maximum centered around 0x so what i'm doing is i'm setting up the screen such that the origin is in the middle of the screen so that we're, we have a space 16 meters wide that we're going to be able to see into in the physics world and 9 meters high. I choose 16 by 9 here because it makes 
so that I don't encounter any weird aspect ratio stretching. So I'm using 16 meters by 9 meters, which is being transformed into 1600 pixels by 900 pixels. That way I don't get any like weird deformation of the object. If it were different values, you might see that they're stretched either to look taller and thinner than they should be or wider and fatter, like fatter. Um, so that that's a common problem that, that you may run into. Oops, I pasted that in the wrong place. So these variables that I've added in uh, are just basically being passed into the start function as x min, x max, y min, y max. So that's what I've done there. So without further ado, um, let's just sort of go over this quickly again. So now I set this up this way to give a little bit of clarity, but really you kind of don't need m. You could write this like just v times p. That would work fine because you really only need these two matrices. I, multiplying any matrix against the identity matrix is the same thing as multiplying any number by one. It just won't change it. That's what an identity is defined as. But I wanted to give this some clarity is that right now our model matrix is the identity matrix. You'll discuss that a different time. For now, it's not something to really worry about too much. We've got enough problems to deal with just thinking about how to set up the camera. Um, so this orthographic call is responsible for setting up the boundaries inside the physics world that the camera is going to perceive. This sets the minimum bounds, maximum bounds on the x-axis minimum and maximum bounds on the y-axis and minimum and maximum bounds on the z-axis. Now I know that everything's going to be positioned at 0, z, so I'm just going between negative 1 and positive 1 so that I know for sure that those things are going to get displayed. But basically this just gives me a rectangular prism and anything in the world that goes inside that region is what will get rendered. So any physics objects that fall within those coordinates are the ones that we should end up seeing. Viewport NDC is a complicated function. I will leave this to Scott because he's the one that wrote it the first place. He probably knows better what this thing is doing than I do. But its purpose is to transform some space that's being rendered by the camera into a flat 2D plane of pixels that can be rendered to a window with a width of pixel width, 1600, by pixel height, 900. This is the magic that makes it so that our coordinate system sort of flips upside down and it acts as though the bottom right corner is our origin instead. Um, so, this is this is interesting. Um, so I'm going to multiply these three things together, and that sets our matrix from this point. Now realize that I am just holding on to this matrix in here, um, and we're going to use that in one other place. So in our render um, code that we have inside our update, we are simply going to do um, something a little bit new. So I'm going to drop in two new lines of code. Um, this is normally not where you would write this in, but we're just going to try and get a simple test out because we're buttoned up against an hour again and I want to make sure that we get this done just so that we can see what's going on. So I've got a vector 3 called physics position. So I'm calling this 2, negative 1. Now remember, I've set this up so that the origin is in the, the center of the screen. Um, yeah, so the origin will not be in the bottom right corner. It will be in the center of the screen in this case. So 0, 0 should be like right smack dab in the middle of the screen. So the vector 2, negative 1 should mean that we're slightly over to the right and a little bit down from the center of the screen and that our object will render somewhere in the bottom right corner. Yeah. Yeah, it should render in the bottom right corner. 
Now, this render position is just simply saying multiply our MVP matrix that we calculated to figure out how to transform this by this position. And then all we're going to do to change this is we're going to say render this texture at render position dot X. Render position, oops. Render position dot Y. So let's give that a try. Build succeeded. You'll notice, first of all, that the screen is white because window.clear was set to clear the window with white. So despite that we had a black screen before, just calling window.clear turns it into a white screen. And you know what, like, why don't we just take a, a quick look at that one thing doing its job. So we've got window.clear. So when I run that, um, oh, all right, that's sure. So window.clear needs to have window.draw, I guess, follow after it in order for this to really work. Um, yeah, okay, so if nothing's rendered, Clearing the window's buffer with white and then drawing the buffer to the window as white will get this to display as white. And so now, of course, we had our physics position to negative one. So as I was suggesting, that should show up somewhere in the bottom right corner because if our origin is like right smack in the middle somewhere here, we've got one, two units over, one unit down, and then it will draw there. Note that it draws from the top left corner. There's a little bit of additional work that you need to do in order to draw things centered nicely, but that's not too big of a problem. We're gonna dive into that another time because we've already gone a pretty long stretch uh, just discussing this so far. So um, yeah, I'll leave that to next week. Um, where we're going to start discussing motion. Um, we're going to start dealing with timekeeping and I'm going to show you how to do something that uh, every game engine has at its heart. We're going to build ourselves a high resolution clock uh, that we can use to keep time in our games and make sure that our physics update has a heartbeat to run on. And um, all right, well anyway, I'll see you next week. Uh, good luck.